Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another Mornings with the Masters, where we devote ourselves to the Lord daily with you. If you're wondering why I'm snickering a little bit, it's because I saw the first few words of this devotional. And let me just tell you, uh uh-oh, is what I'm going to say. Uh-oh for you and uh uh-oh for me. But before we jump in, I did just want to quickly just ask for prayer over our family. Um, Sleep has been really uh, a tough one, and I'm sure you all have experienced maybe a season or more um, where it feels like sleep deprivation sets in. It just makes everything more difficult, a lot more quick to anger, be more stressed, just everything. And we know that this will just be first season. This is this was what comes with having a newborn. But um, I just want Tori to uh, feel rested and to feel like herself. And I know she wants that too. And we're going to make sure that we don't have too much on her plate. Um, but we're really trying to figure out the sleep thing. And so your prayers of that would just be lovely. Um, yeah. Anyways, just th- just just thanks for thinking of us. Love you guys. I'm just going to go jump in. We're jumping in with New Morning Mercies. And this is what it says. Your life really is shaped by whom you cry to. If your cry is a complaint, you will find yourself with other complainers because misery loves company and your heart will grow more discouraged and hardened. If you cry to people instead of God, you will ask those people to do what only God can do. They will feel overwhelmed and unable and you will will grow more desperate. If you silence your cries, crying only to yourself, you will feel increasingly alone and without anyone who cares and understands, and you'll feel more and more helpless. The good news of the gospel is that you don't have to muffle your cries. You don't have to be ashamed that you have a reason to cry, and you surely don't have to feel that God is too grand or too far off or too busy with more important things than to listen to your measly little cries for help. I think one of the reasons for the Psalms I'm about to read in the Bible is to give us courage to cry and to teach us when to cry. The first one is Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. Psalm 4, 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Psalm 10, 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Psalm 35, verse 1. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Psalm 42, verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? And finally, Psalm 60, verse 1. O God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. O restore us. There are many more passages like these in the Psalms. They are there to encourage you to cry to the one who will never turn a deaf ear to your cries and who has the power and the willingness to meet you in your need. And I think just coming off the bat real quick, I just want to clarify what the author was saying. He's not saying don't cry to people. He's saying, make sure that you run to God first and make sure you're not running to people rather than or instead of God. I I know you are are gelling with that, but I just wanted to be clear that God will use people and he does use people in your life. But remember, the power to help you and the willingness to meet your need comes from him and he works through people. And so we have to make sure that we understand that it's him who's doing the helping through a willing person. But there's a few other things I wanted to point out from this devotional. I think the first one, actually, I did not expect it to mean something to me, and hopefully it means something to you. But almost all of the scripture I just read to you, almost all of them were verse one of a chapter. You ready for this? Psalm 3, verse 1. Psalm 4, verse 1, Psalm 10, verse 1, Psalm 13, verse 1, Psalm 22, verse 1, Psalm 35, verse 1, Psalm 60, verse 1. How many of those are verse 1s? 
And I just love that whether it was David or a different psalmist, they're opening their psalm, where are you? What is going on? Help me, restore me, shield me, protect me, love me. I just think that's so powerful. And I can only imagine what the rest of of those psalms say, what the rest of the chapter will say. And I'm sure it ends with some type of help or some type of hope rather. And I just think it's beautiful that I think we can learn a lot from this because God chose to include this in the canon of scripture. He chose to, to teach us how to cry out as true children of the Most High God, our loving Abba Father. And we all want that relationship and that dependency. We don't want to live these lives where we're disillusioned thinking that, oh no, well, I'll hang up myself. He's too busy. He doesn't really care. I don't want to bother him with that or I'll figure it out. It's really not that big of a deal. What? A God who's infinitely powerful not only is able to help us, but he's willing. But I know for some of us, our experience of that doesn't match our knowledge of that. Our knowledge of that is far greater than our experience of God's love for us. And I think we have to make sure that we look at it through the context of how God is helping us and what God is doing versus what he isn't doing. I know there's been a lot of times in my life where I look at what God isn't doing and then I project that God doesn't love me because he's not doing my will, but instead he's doing his will. And so I have to make sure I look at it through the vantage point of his will for his kingdom and him being infinitely more knowledgeable than I am. And to me, something I do say that's a a small reminder for myself is I say, I'm not going to get to heaven and say, oh, but God, you didn't have to do that. I'm going to get to heaven and say, oh, that makes sense. I'm sorry I couldn't see what you saw, God. And I'm sorry I made it all about me and not all about you. And the final thing I want to touch on for this devotional is just something that um, I need to work on myself. I don't know if you're in a place that you need to work on this. Um, Something we all struggle with from time to time. I don't know why I'm getting emotional talking about it, but I think I'm just mad at myself um, about this. But um, just the opening two sentences. Your life is really shaped by whom you cry to. If your cry is a complaint, you will find yourself with other complainers because misery loves company. And your heart will grow more discouraged and hardened. And I've experienced that in my life. I think the older I get, the more adult type stuff I have to experience. And you can feel kind of lonely in that. It feels like every time you get over one hurdle, there's another one and another one and another one and another one and another one. You get my point. And so I think that I have taken the easy way out in some areas where I just chose to complain about my quote unquote issues. Actually, no, I'm not gonna say quote unquote issues. I'm gonna stand on them because they are real in my life about the issues that I'm facing. And I choose to allow my heart to become hardened towards them. And I see them as obstacles versus opportunities. And so I I wanna get back my um, joyful heart, not my complainer heart. And I will admit, it's hard when it feels like you're just being surrounded by every which way you turn, you're you're being pulled and you're pulled and you're having to figure something out. And it feels like, okay, well, what do I do now? I'm just being stretched beyond what I can endure right now. Um, but count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I I need to declare that scripture over my life. Count it all joy. Though the enemy comes at you six ways, he will flee in seven ways. Yeah, I just want to I just want to rebuke the heart of of complaints, you know? It doesn't help you, it doesn't help me, it doesn't help my family, it doesn't help God, it doesn't help this ministry, it doesn't help anything. Complaining does not help anything. That's not to say it doesn't feel good from time to time, but it's not helping anything. Words have power. In the beginning, God said, I I want my words to have power to be helpful, not hurtful. Oh, Lord. 
Thank you for just a wonderful, convicting devotional. Transparently, I'll tell the audience this, God. Um, I had to re-record this devotional a few times because I kept getting interrupted and I was so tempted to complain to our editor. I was so quick to want to mumble under my breath. And fortunately, I didn't. Praise God. Fortunately, I chose to bite my tongue. I was slow to anger. Praise you, God, that you worked in me in that moment. And God, I just pray that you'll help us all rebuke that, that gut reflex to want to complain about our situation, whatever we're going through, whether big or small. Help us to have hearts of joy. Help to see opportunities rather than obstacles. Help us to run and cry to you. Help us to, to really see and experience and know that not only are you able to help us, you want to, God. We love you and we pray in your son's heavenly name. Amen. Amen, y'all. Now's the perfect time to break out the worship music, break out the journal, and continue pressing to the Lord. Don't forget that you are God's masterpiece. Don't forget to love you. We love you and we talk to you tomorrow. I'll be the same.